It's the breakfast in Plus TV Africa. It's time where we look at the pages of our dailies. We call it Off the Press. Okwena Nkotaria joins the conversation as a public affairs analyst, as always, on Mondays. Uh, he joins via phone. It's good to have you join us this morning. Good morning, Matthew. My pleasure. Good morning, dear. All right. Happy belated Independence Day celebration. I wish you so, my dear. All right, then let's start off with the leadership newspaper uh, this morning. And looking at it, you have very interesting headlines on the leadership. The bold caption says, as Buhari's administration winds down in 11 months, Nigeria still grapples with terrorism, kidnappings, and killings. Underneath, 913 killed. 265 abducted in 421 attacks last month. Uh, this according to a report. Now, 30 wedding guests kidnapped in Sokoto, 11 killed in Benue. You also have another rider saying, Southwest governors revisit state pleas to strengthen Amoteku. We have done a lot to tackle challenges. This is according to, uh, you know, the defense ministry. However, we'll move away from that. AKT 2022, IGP deploys DIG, four AIGs and four helicopters. Now, the question has always been, why do we constantly mil militarize our elections? Don't pay lip service to credible election, PDP replies President Mohamed Buhari after the speech. New health insurance expert faults 300 naira monthly per enrollee. <laughs> Nigeria's democracy is growing. The vice president, Yemi Osibajo, is quoted on that. And Serap asks flag bearers to publish asset, reject vote buying because, you know, you have the consequence for... Buying and selling of votes at the end. Bakari congratulates Tunubu candidates' uh, disowned viral manifesto. I mean, these are some of the headlines on the leadership newspaper this morning. Away from the leadership newspaper, we quickly take a look at the Daily Independent. Now on the Daily Independent, Nigerian Air stakeholders query identity of 95 investors and directors. And that's quite interesting. Deployment of Utah's condition for suspending strike. This is what AS is saying. So AS is saying, hey, it's not about X, Y, Z, but we're talking about the mode of payment, which is Utah's. Uh, well, let's see how all of that pans out. That's the bold caption this morning. Bandits abduct 50 wedding guests along Sokoto Zamfara Highway. This is according to a report. We averted catastrophic accident or incident in Abuja, Kanu last week. Military chief is saying, or oh, massacre, poor turnouts greets churches as St. Francis Catholic Church remains short. Would you expect? Yeah. Saraki Obi, Samuel Lu, Uzodima asks Nigerians, asks Nigerians to keep faith in democracy and country. I will carry PDP stakeholders along in choosing my running mate. Atiku is quoted on that. You also have politicians mulling Muslims tickets, inviting cures, can warns. This is time to strengthen democracy, social cohesion. The vice president is also quoted to say that. I remain AFN national president pending an appeal. Ibrahim is also reporting on that one. But we'll move away from the Daily Independent. Uh, let's quickly take a look at the punch. Now on the punch, APC may unveil Tunubu's running mate Wednesday. Party focuses on North East. Party won the over Muslim Muslim ticket. Majority leader says no cost for lamb. Vice president should come from the northeast. Governors focusing on the zone. Uh, you also have APC may concede the Senate president to the southeast 
speaker to the Northwest. Federal government borrowings from CBN hits 19 trillion naira. Inflation may worsen. Oh, you also have Democracy Day. Governors demand credible elections. OPC don cries feeding bottle federalism. Oh, federalism, uh, that's what you find. The writers are not quite uh, clever. We'll just move on to other headlines on the punch just before we move away from the punch newspaper. Kaduna Rivers, 30 orders attract zero foreign investment in first quarter. I'm sure you want to find out why that is. Federal government was wrong to shut Nigerian borders. Deputy President Freight Forwarders is quoted than that. Federal government meets ASU today, Sanu on Friday. And ASU is saying the only reason the strike will be suspended if, if, if the government agrees to the payment system which is called the UTAS. The government has said, I mean, it's a fraudulent system. On the other hand, Einek is saying, the AS system is also fraudulent. But whose report do we believe? Away from that, contributory pension gains, 640 billion naira in four months, hits uh, 14 trillion naira. And federal government invests 379.6 billion in 23 state erosion control. Blackout worsens as greed collapses the fifth time in 2022. Uh, you have more interesting headlines, but for the want of time, we just move away from the punch. And let's quickly take a look at the Nation newspaper this morning. On the Nation, Southwest governors draw battle plan against terrorists. And our church killings ignite action three days mourning for our victims Okada riders influx to be curtailed. That's what you find. Another one says, Supreme Court justice deployed poor service conditions. Gunmen kill 11 in Benway community. 50 abducted in Sokoto. And Democracy Day, you find, we have made progress, says federal government. Fourth anniversary marked in Abuja and states. Tunable campaign organization disowns fake manifesto. Umayi under fire for attacking Ohanese President Obi Azor. And you also find states to share World Bank's 750 million naira facility. I mean, constantly the question has been put why do we, what are we always about sharing? What are we bringing to the table? Well, that's the much we can take this morning on the papers. Let's head over to um, Okunabon Kataria, who joins us via phone this morning to share his thoughts on the headlines. Okunabon Kataria, it's good to have you join us once again. Yes, my pleasure, Messi. Uh, let's start off with the papers now. I'd like to leave it open to you. Which of the headlines interest you as I went through the pages of a national dailies? Well, they're all interesting, so we can start with any one of the choice. So go ahead. Let me see the papers, please, on the screen. Okay, so let's start off with the leadership now, uh, now that you've handed the ball back to me. As Buhari's administration winds down in 11 months, uh, reporters saying that Nigeria is still grappling with terrorism, kidnappings, and killings. Do you agree with this accession? I mean, that, that's very fragile. In other words, I think you can't controvert that fact. On a daily basis, we hear of kidnappings, killings, uh, terrorism all over the country. I mean, it, it's been contemporized by the media as well because you don't have a choice. You have to immediately reflect the society. So when these things happen, you just have to report them. No doubt um, the government has been overwhelmed by these uh, terrorists who on daily basis daily basis uh, wreak havoc on Nigeria and Nigerians as a big barbecue of Nigerians, you know. We just heard of your war. We also heard of what happened yesterday on Democracy Day. And all we get from the federal government is just uh, rhapsody. You know, every day they come on air, they make promises, they tell you the, the federal government will tell you it's done its best on top of the situation and so on. But it's like Messi, somebody coming to tell you that Messi, you're a man. 
I mean, such a person, when I say it, you now, you know what, now Messi will jump on your head. But how will somebody come to tell you, Messi, that you're a man? <laughs> and you begin to, you want to examine the person's head. On daily basis, you tell us you're on top of the situation. Yeah, the situation is faster. So I don't know how you're on top of such a situation. So my dear Messi and dear Nigerians, I can tell you that when it comes to economy, when it comes to security, the federal government has performed additionally. In fact, the federal government has failed woefully when it comes to the economy and when it comes to security. Uh, Nigerians are the mercy. Some governors have even cried out, saying that these terrorists have taken over half of their, their, their state. They are in charge of local governments. They've hoisted their flags and so on. Some even take, uh, what is it called, levies and taxes from uh, the villagers. And they say you're on top of the situation. The annoying thing is that certain persons who I can refer to as enablers, like Gumi and Co., will make inflammatory statements with impunity. Will dare the federal government look at what he said about uh, the killings in Owo without a change of culture, trying to justify the killing. I mean, how, how else will, 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 will it come? What else do you need to prove that these are enablers? And they are benefiting tremendously from from the the killings and the the, the uh, uh, kidnappings and terrorism going on in this country. And you have a federal government that is just silent. But if any South Anna, especially the those from the South, should make such a comment, they will either invade that territory or arrest such a person. So, my dear sister, I can tell you that. Uh, the leadership is absolutely correct. Uh, the federal government has failed roughly in addressing the uh, security situation and the economic situation in the country. But, uh, but um, let's also look at this now. If you look at the security situation, it seems to be a global concern. I mean, it's not just peculiar to Nigeria. You, you have even developed climes where you have proper structures and you want to say that the government is on top of the situation grappling with a lot for instance the united states has been on top of the news of recent times with the recent shootings in different parts and so don't you think that you know it's, it's just a universal issue and not necessarily um you know a nigerian problem let us not uh, try to embellish the facts or uh well let's like employ what we refer to as in uh, criminology techniques of neutralization. That would be absolutely, excuse me, not be absolutely wrong. In the civilized crimes, the perpetrators are arrested and there is swift response. There is no such thing as unknown gunmen. You don't hear that in civilized crimes. But that's what you hear. That's the mantra right now, unknown gunmen. Every time unknown gunmen. And in civilized crimes, the perpetrators are arrested. How many of them are arrested here? So you cannot make comparisons. Of course, there is no country in this world that is devoid of crime. The more civilized you are, the more criminal activities you are bound to experience. No doubt about that. I mean, it's you know, a crime goes with uh, civilization. That we all agree. But the steps taken by the government is what makes the difference. So you cannot compare the uh, civilized countries to Nigeria, where everything you hear is on top of the situation where nothing is done. In civilized crimes, you cannot vote money and release the, that money to service chiefs and their successors will come on them to say there is nothing to show for it, that uh, nothing was bought with the money released. And you appoint those service, same service chiefs as ambassadors. It won't happen in any civilized life. That, that is encouraging criminality in itself. So you vote money, maybe a trillion dollars, a trillion naira, to buy uh, equipment to fight the crime. And the equipment are not bought. And those who ought to have been punished are being made ambassadors. You can't have that issue. So the, the, the situation is this thing. You can't hear of a non-government in civilized life. You can't hear that. 
And once these things happen, the government reacts promptly. They arrest perpetrators. That is what happens. Has it happened in Nigeria? Not at all. So please, there is no comparison whatsoever. Okay. But, uh, you know, I mean, from, from, from what you're saying is that uh, the approach is different. So you have crime uh, and the issue of, you know, uh, security as a major concern in different climes. But at the end of the day, it's the approach. But we also have, just as you have the police structure, you also have police. You, you have everything that it takes just as you would have in this climb. So the problem or the question would be, why are we not having the desired result? Why are we not making the arrest? And why are we there not is some level of, uh, There is some level of complicity, high level. You know, it was the Nigerian military head of state. Late now, I don't want to use the word of blessed memory. We all know why. Late now, <laughs> who said for crime, take crime for crime to last for 48 hours, then the government is involved. That is a military head of state. Who said that? And that is a fact. So, so, so you're, so you're saying, so you're saying that the government. So, are you saying that the government is responsible for the insecurity that we're experiencing right now? That the government has a uh, hand mercy, in mercy, mercy. Without the uh, provocations, mercy. I've said this a billion times now. I've said the government is complicit. I've said it a billion times. How else? You give money to somebody. Okay, you send an IG to Bruno. A former ID to Bruno, he disobeys you. That in itself is insubordination. You go to Bruno a few months after, a few weeks after, and only to be told that the ID never spent a night there. What did you say? You said, Oh, you go back and interrogate. The ID starts that his term. No punishment for him. How else can he be complacent? Look at what Bubi is doing. You are silent. Look at what happened to the former service chief. The NSA came on air to say the service chief did not use the money that was voted to buy the ass. Their successors said the same thing. You made them ambassadors. How else can you be complicit? That, without education, the federal government is complicit. All right, then. Thank you. Well, let's move away from that uh, so we can also share your thoughts on other issues. I mean, still looking at the leadership newspaper, you have Sarah asking flag bearers to publish assets and reject vote buying. Now, what difference will this make as we inch close to our 2023 elections? Whether they publish your assets or not, does it stop? Sarah is asking flag bearers to publish their asset, more like asset declaration, um, yes. and also asking that they reject vote buying. I don't know how these things can be, but I'm saying that what difference does this make if they declare their asset? Does it change anything? Well, if, they declare, if they declare their asset, it is a way of gauging the very largest uh, the South as uh, a barometer to know if, for example, what you declared, and by the time you hit office, what you're also going to declare, because it's even a law. So if Sarah, Sarah is only retreating it, it's only accentuating it, it's, it's a law. Once you uh, you have an appointment or you're elected into office, you declare your asset. That's why you have the CCB and the CCT. So it, it's already a law. Now, the whole essence is to check fraud. Because some people go into office and enrich themselves at the expense of the state and Nigeria by extension. So if you declare your asset, say you have just two houses, but at the end of that tenure, of four years, when your first term probably will, have been, uh, uh, will come to an end, and you now have five or six houses, of course, they'll have to interrogate. So know how you got the extra one or two houses. Uh, when they look at your the practices of your office in terms of remuneration and what have you. So the whole essence is to check fraud. But we all know that Nigerians and politicians know how to circumvent this process. 
they will get this property by first week, buy the houses in the names of their friends, colleagues, family members, and what have you. But that is left for the security agencies, the anti graft agencies to do a thorough job, just as they did with the attorney general, sorry, the accountant general of the federation, and so on, who who have been admitted to bail. And I can assure you that that matter will be consigned into oblivion. What they, only, what they are just doing is employ what we call the Fabian policy. With the passage of time, it will be consigned into oblivion, and that is the end of that, and end of it. So there's nothing wrong with that that is saying that act is actually not new. You have it in the CCD, and you have the CCT to try to offend that. So there is really nothing new. Now, when you talk of the vote buying, uh, politicians will always want to buy votes. And Nigerians are so hungry, impecunious, they need money to survive. You can't tell the Nigerian not to accept money and vote his concerned. And the first question he's going to ask is, how do I pay my child school fees? How do I pay my rent? How do I eat for that day? You see, these are the issues. So while we are against vote buying or vote selling, but the issue is you must get an environment that will also serve as a deterrent. And the Nigerians must be able to feed themselves, if not three, at least two square meals, at least be able to address the basic needs. That is when you can make sense to any Nigerian when you say don't sell your vote or don't buy your vote. But when you see a man who cannot pee and somebody gives him 5,000 naira, not everybody can resist that temptation. It's difficult to resist that temptation. We have to be honest with ourselves. He wants to leave for, for the office. We're not talking about luxury. We're talking about basic things now. He wants to go to work in the morning. If he doesn't go to work, that, that money he will attack. Meanwhile, he doesn't have the money to go to work. His child will have to go to school. They give him 5,000. That will be enough for his child for a week. And that's what he's going uh, uh, What do you want him to do? But my point is... We seem to be having a haul back from you. So I'd like that you uh, probably turn, you know, turn off the volume of your... TV set, if that's on, because we're having a feedback right now, and uh, that would actually help us have a smooth conversation. But let's just stay quickly with the leadership newspaper now. We're we'll just okay. So I think this is better. Let's uh, let's just look at one on the leadership before we uh, we turn our attention to the punch. Now on the leadership, uh, the AKT elections very close. We're looking at June the 18th. And we're hearing that, you know, there'll be deployment of, uh, you know, DIG, uh, you have the AIGs and, you know, four helicopters. And we're just talking about high presence of, you know, security personnel for that election. Now, two school of thought. Others are saying we cannot constantly militarize our elections. That has always been the pattern. But on the other hand, you can also not take out the fact that security is a major concern. So where do we um, go from here? What are your thoughts? So for now, I think uh, it's, it's necessary. Because when you, when you consider the political tension and also uh, consider the security situation in the country, I think we need, we need uh, that number of uh, policemen during uh, the AKT. And not just AKT, any elections for now in this country, because you have the terrorists who might want to strike. You also have hoodlums who might want to disrupt the process. The whole issue of security has really nothing to do with safeguarding uh, the process, so to speak. In other words, to prevent smashing of ballot boxes as well. I mean, we passed that stage now. Even if it's not the ballot box, it won't take it anywhere. I mean, it will amount to nothing. So it's all about the maintenance of law and order at the various polling units. So I think it is extremely necessary for now when you consider the volatile, the highly combustible political situation, um, especially with the reign of terrorism in this country, 
you need these people around there. You need, because these terrorists might want to make a statement. They might also want to truncate the process. So you need the security at this point in time. With the passage of time, I think uh, when the situations have, both of these situations, uh, situations have been contained, probably we are going to reduce the number. But we, yeah, I don't think we will ever, ever, in the next 10 years, be able with security personnel during elections. Probably the numbers will reduce. But for now, it is important. It's expedient that you have them. Mm. All right, so quickly on the punch, uh, the, the banner caption talks about the APC uh, and its plan to unveil its running mate on Wednesday, and the focus is going to be on the Northeast, and that's it. But you also have some quarters that are saying, I mean, some persons are saying, wh where is fairness and where is equity? If we're looking at, you know, the gentleman's agreement, even though it's not constitutionally recognized, how come the party is not even considering uh, zoning or having, you know, the vice president slot coming from the South is, especially, you know, with all of the concerns? Yes, I agree. Uh, to, to a very large extent. But let us also not forget that what is paramount now for the political party is winning the election. So when you talk of choosing a candidate, you must take that into consideration. That is number one. Number two, you have two major blocks, the North and the South. You have a Southern president, presidential candidate, and the person of Tinibu. Although I'm advanced to his presidency for so many reasons, principally on her ground, because we are going to have a rehash of the Yaradua or, God forbid, Buhari scenario. And it's going to take a toll on Nigeria. But I will say that is there, Nigerians are going to decide. Now, you have Tinubu from the South. Definitely, it is only wise and expedient that you take somebody from the North. So, if the APC is considering a Northern candidate, I don't think it should be faulted. Yeah, the sentiments of Southeast and the issue of uh, uh, trying to placate the evils, the Southeasterners who believe that they have been marginalized or discriminated against. That you have the PDP. The choice is uh, theirs. It's either you vote for the APC or you vote for the PDP or you vote for local party. But for the APC, if we have to be honest with ourselves, this presidential candidate is from the South, then the vice presidential is running that must come from the North. I think it's only fair. And I don't think anybody should select the APC for that reason. You cannot take from the South, because whether you like it or not, it is of the South, yeah? the South is, is also of the South. So you have a presidential candidate that is running it from the South. No, but that's not fair. That's not fair. We want to come from the south. I want to come from the north. Mm. But also, uh, as logical as that sounds, uh, with all of the arrangement, because I mean, I mean, th th there's no words written. I mean, uh, in the constitution uh, of of all of that logic and and uh, yeah, that was one, uh, that's plan. That's why I said. That's why I said expedient. We are talking of expediency now. Yeah. And, and, and it's also backed by logic. Okay. Because you don't have two south on them. Well, no, I, I mean, who say... Open up on Kataria. Open up on Kataria. I mean, let's also look at this, if we're talking about logic. So these things are not rocket science. It's not, it's not fixed. There are no... There are no... Not stone. Exactly. Not stone. So, so the point is, so what, what is wrong if you have... Uh, you know, a southwestern candidate and a southeastern candidate, if it's not cast in stone, if it's logic. I mean, That's who says I mean. that cannot happen? Ma yeah, yeah, Mercy, Mercy if, you, if you listen to me, I said it is expedient. First and foremost, what you consider is how to win the elections. You need the vote from the north. If you take the south, east, the north and north will feel excluded. And then I deny you that vote. You see, that's why I say, if we are not talking of uh, what is right and what is wrong, we are talking of what is expedient.
So you need the vote from the north. And if you exclude them, of course, it's not allowed if they're not allowed to just say, let us give the whole vote to Atiku, who is already a Nathana, and who is also going to take a, 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 a running mate from the south. So you have an advantage. You take all these things under advisement. These things are going to decide, dictate to you your choice of a running mate. Okay, you like, know, it's, it's not just saying. I mean, I mean, open a bank, Katara. You you, you, you have made a very uh, you have made your points a very uh, strong points that you have reasoned or made right there. But let's also look at it now differently, but the same issue on the Daily Independent. It talks about um, you know the consent of having a Muslim Muslim ticket, and that's what it is. Because if you look at the North East, I mean, how. Uh, much of, you know, a Christian candidate are you going to get from there? We cannot take these things out because all of these factors always influence the electoral process, whether or not we like it or not. Religion has always been top on the notch and you can't take out, you know, uh, you know, uh, zoning as well. I mean, the zone, different zones. But here you have Khan also raising concern about a Muslim, Muslim ticket saying, hey, this is going to be chaotic and that's not what we want for our country. Now, also bearing in mind that in 2015, apparently, maybe we probably would have had the former uh, governor of Lagos State running as vice president with uh, President Muhammad Buhari at the time. But it wasn't going to work because it was going to be a Muslim Muslim ticket. I also remember that, you know, in 1993, as long as we're celebrating, you know, the democracy day, the um, Abiola ticket was a Muslim Muslim ticket. And it felt like Nigerians accepted that. So I'm just wondering how this thing's is going to play out eventually if you have okay, a political me, party tilting towards a Muslim Muslim ticket. Uh, what, what do you think the outcome mm -hmm. will become or will be? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. 1993, not... 1993 is a different scenario altogether. Okay. One, Nigerians were in a hurry to get out of the matrix's rule. So anything democracy was acceptable. Really? That is why. Because a lot of people impugned the transition process of Babangida, who kept shifting the date. There's a hold back. There's a hold back. I think it's from your end. Because I can, everything is needed here. I can hear yeah. you clearly. So, Just go ahead. Okay. Nigeria, good. It's better now. It's better now. Yeah. So, uh, I think we shifting the dates. The evil genius kept shifting the dates. You understand? And so, a lot of people doubted the transition process. And so, we welcome anything that was going to usher in democracy. That is different. Number two, the popularity of Yola has. It's difficult for any Nigerian today to have such a popularity and acceptability. The focus was on Adiola himself, not even on King Dede. Now, having said that, we have been so polarized right now in this country that it will be foolhardy to ignore the sensitive nature of religion in our politics. A Muslim Muslim candidate. Definitely will spell doom for any party. Just as a Christian Christian candidate will spell doom for any party. Because you know there is a cold war, whether we accept it or not, between the Muslims and the Christians. There is that cold war in this country, whether we, we agree on national telly or not. Muslims watch Christians with John Day's eyes. The Christians also watch Muslims with John Day's eyes. And that is why Khan is making that statement. That it will not accept a Muslim Muslim candidate. We cannot pretend that this thing is false lies don't exist. They do exist. And that is the problem Jinnibu is going to have because the South is a Muslim from the South. And if we talk about Christian from the North, that Christian from the north will not be accepted by Northerners just the way Muslim, a Muslim from the north will be accepted. So how many votes will the Christian bring to the table? So there is a conundrum. Is in a fish? I'm talking of Tunisia right now. Ashiku has a better chance. He's a Muslim from the north. He can take any Southerner from the south. Southerners are predominantly Christians. So I think we're definitely not going to have that problem. The problem I think is going to have right now is 
who will bring more votes and value to his election? That's the problem. Is that that's why they are talking of Okoa and Wiki. But in the case of Tinubu, most 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 of who are most who are prominent and can add value to his electors are Muslims. So I need to get a Muslim on board as a running mate. <laughs> it's going to be catastrophic politically. I can tell you that. All right. Because most Christians will not even vote for him. I can tell you that. From the south, most of them. It's my like first thing that election. Then from the north, how many Christians are, how many Muslims are Muslim, are Christians that will vote for him? So they're not even vote for That's what they'll do. So he's in a fish right now. I pray God will grant him the grace to still through this other. So are, are you saying that Nigerians who chose competence over religion, or, you know, they would choose religion Nigeria, over competence? Let, me, let, us, let us not deceive ourselves with the issue of competence. You have competent people in every zone. You have them. You have competent people you know, from the southeast. Don't you have uh, people who are that they are not even from the south south? You have them also in the north. You have competent people all over. Now, from the pool, you will choose. And when you're choosing, you consider certain things. Competence, that's why there's somebody that adds value. I just summarize it. Somebody that will bring books, number one. Somebody that is intelligent and competent, that will assist the number one man to succeed. <laughs> These are all the valuable things to consider. So when people say uh, confidence, it is all inclusive. And you have them in every zone, you have them in every state. Not just zone, you have them in every state. Also, um, just as you, you were actually putting out your thoughts and the analogy, you made reference to the fact that in 1993, the difference is that Nigerians were in a hurry to, you know, just get out of the military era. Yeah, they were, so, they, yeah, they were but, 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 I, but are you sure that was the case or it was a case of acceptance? It was a case where for the very first time, Nigerians who put down their religious sentiment and decide to embrace competence and capacity. Yes, that is. You know, I told you, if, if, if you if you listen carefully, Matty, I said it's a, it's a portmanteau of issues, not just one isolated. I right. said competence, acceptability, which is legitimacy, popularity, and so on. Yeah, they were all brought, considered and brought together. And the, after that time, Nigeria was a hankering for civilian rule or democratic rule. That, that is the game. And two, the fourth line we are not as accentuated as they are right now. We didn't have terrorism at that point. You hardly heard of Nigerians committing suicide and so on. So the situation is quite distinct. Now, Nigerians have been sensitized to the actuality of the artificiality of oneness. That is the problem we have in this country. And when you are in politics, this is also considered. Why do you have people shouting, is the time in the town of the north, is the town of the east, is the town of the west, is the town of the south? And in 1992, 1992, we didn't have that. So the situation is different. You know. Katarier, uh, many thanks for being part of the breakfast this morning. We are out of time and we would definitely um, love to share your thoughts and more interesting headlines as we proceed in the course of the week. Thank you so much for being part of the show this morning. Do have Thank a fantastic you, day. All right, then. That's the size of, of the press this morning. I hope you had a great time. Uh, let's take a break and tell you what happened today in history. We'll be right back with the breakfast. <laughs>